Foundation. All right, hi everyone, my name is Serene, and today I'll be presenting on the emerging intersectional field of trauma and psychosis. In the United States alone, approximately 3 million individuals are diagnosed with psychosis. Of these, approximately 70% report histories of trauma, abuse, or significant stress, leading scientists to believe that trauma is comorbid with psychosis and that early histories of trauma may be a risk factor for the later development of psychosis. But what is psychosis, you ask? Psychosis is a symptom of many major neuropsychiatric disorders, most notably schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. When you have someone who has psychosis, they display two distinct types of symptoms. Positive symptoms, which include hallucinations and delusions, and negative symptoms, which includes depression and anxiety. The relationship between trauma and psychosis can be explained through a cognitive framework. When an individual experiences trauma, it leads to the formation of negative schemas, or beliefs that one is vulnerable to threats or that the world around them is a dangerous place. These beliefs lead to paranoid ideation, which is a hallmark of psychosis. Additionally, social trauma can lead to the formation of paranoid ideation in the form of delusional voices. The relationship can also be explained from the neurophysiological perspective. Individuals who have undergone, undergone severe trauma often display neuroanatomical abnormalities, specifically in the prefrontal cortex and limbic systems, both areas of the brain that are also afflicted in psychosis. The relationship can also be further explained through the HPA axis, a neuroendocrine system that we're all very familiar with. When an individual experiences trauma, three major and permanent changes take place. The hypothalamus becomes less sensitive to stressors, the negative feedback mechanism falters, and the stress hormone regulation of the dopaminergic system fails. It's this third occurrence that is often related to psychosis, as dysregulated dopamine leads to misattribution, hallucinations, and delusions. This is why in psychotic patients, we see an increase in the amount of dopamine compared to controls and a decrease in the amount of glutamate. So there's a relationship between trauma and psychosis, but why is this important to understand? This is because one-fourth of all psychiatric patients are psychosis patients, and over 75% of them find treatment unsuccessful, costing approximately $80,000 a year per patient in lost productivity and healthcare costs. So it's important to identify this relationship to create better treatment strategies for individuals who are afflicted with both. Today we'll be looking at a study that focuses on a novel therapeutic technique that takes advantage of this relationship between trauma and psychosis, to better treat these patients. Published in June 2017 by Keenan colleagues in London, this study is Integrated Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavior Therapy for Post-Traumatic Stress and Psychotic Symptoms. Currently, the treatment strategies for individuals with trauma or PTSD is a prescription of anxiolytics and CBT, while the treatment strategies for psychosis is a prescription of antipsychotics and CBT. Because both disorders have CBT, a psychotherapy we learned about earlier this semester, in common, this is what Keen and colleagues focused on when they asked their question, for psychotic patients with a history of trauma, is it better to combine CBT techniques for both PTSD and psychosis into a single protocol? In order to answer this question, the researchers used a very unique methodology. First, they recruited nine participants, five males, four females, of an average age of 37 years, of the participants, 78% of were the 78% of them were people of color, and 89% of them were unemployed. This is interesting because this actually represents a very general sample of individuals with psychosis. And though they varied in their psychosis and trauma diagnoses, all of the participants had clinically diagnosed psychosis and PTSD. The timeline of the study took place over the course of several years, with assessments taken at very distinct time points. Baseline at zero months, pre-therapy at eight months, post-therapy at 22 months, and then follow-up at 31 months. The most intriguing and unique aspect to their study was their integrated CBT protocol that consisted of five distinct phases. Phase one, assessment and goal setting. Phase two, developing coping strategies. Phase three, linking past trauma to current PTSD and psychosis techniques. Phase four, the integrated CBT procedure, and phase five, relapse prevention. In order to assess the effectiveness of this novel therapy, the researchers enlisted several measures that diagnosed and assessed the symptoms found in PTSD and psychosis. 
This included the post-traumatic diagnostic scale, the psychotic symptoms rating scale, the Beck depression and anxiety inventories, the satisfaction with therapy questionnaire, and the core 10, which measured emotional well-being. So what were the results from the study? First, we'll take a look at post-traumatic stress scores. There was a slight decrease in scores from baseline to follow-up for all participants, and a, downward, a significant downward trajectory. In terms of psychotic symptoms, there was a significant decrease in both voices and delusions throughout the course of therapy. Depression showed the greatest downward trajectory and changes in all participants from baseline to follow-up, and a similar pattern was shown in anxiety scores from baseline to follow-up. In terms of satisfaction with their therapy, participants reported high degrees of satisfaction, progress, trust in their therapists, feeling understood, and also understanding their diagnoses themselves. In terms of the core 10, there was also a significant decrease in core 10 scores, which corresponded to a greater emotional well-being. So what did these results hold for the greater context of trauma and psychosis? Because researchers found a decrease in both positive symptoms and negative symptoms of psychosis, these results show a promising result. These results are promising in the in the treatment of psychosis in individuals who also report histories of trauma. But like any scientific inquiry, this study was not without its limitations and unanswered questions. Perhaps the greatest limitation of this study was its sample size. Being only nine strong, this sample size was significantly small even for a case-based analysis like this. Additionally, the therapists that participated in this study were extremely well-versed and trained in this integrated approach. In fact, they developed it themselves. And so this may not be applicable to therapists who have no knowledge of this beforehand. Additionally, the depression measure was switched halfway through the study for some of the participants, which, which led to a loss in some of the depression data. And finally, though the scores were improved over time and over the course of therapy, most participants and for most symptoms, the, the scores still remained in the moderate to severe range. In the future, it would be interesting to replicate the study with a more diverse and larger sample size, as well as with therapists of varying experience and knowledge of the protocol. It would also be interesting to see if there was any changes neuroanatomically and neurophysiologically from baseline to follow-up by incorporating brain imaging data like fMRI or EEG. And also, it would be interesting to see if modifications to the protocol, like taking different parts or like combining different areas of the CBT, would lead to an increase in effectiveness. But for now, I want to leave you with a testimonial from one of the participants of the study that echoes the promising results of this treatment. They say, I feel more in control now. I still hear the voices, but I don't have to do what they say. I don't feel like I'm back there again. They're just memories from the past. Thank you.